Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, it's Bill Burns. It's time for another wonderful episode of the Bill Bert Pod Cast. What's going on? How are you, Bert? I'm doing good. I'm having a, a clean today, Bill. Every time I clean, I think of you because I know you like cleaning. I don't like cleaning. I just don't like a dirty house. Yeah, I'd rather live in misery and squalor and be happy. I can be happy in a, as a as a hoarder. As a hoarder? Yeah, I could. I could be okay. happy. All right. Well, that's good. Do you, do you follow the NBA, Bill? I used to follow the NBA. I uh, somewhere along the line, once it was like all all the stars became friends, then they all pile on one team and then <laughs> beat the shit out of the other thirty. I just, there was something just weird about it. Like, uh, I sort of maintain, if you watch Jordan's The Last Dance, one of the best parts was when he couldn't get past the Pistons, so he dug down deeper, he got tougher mentally, lifted weights. All these guys today, so many of them, at that point in their documentary, it's like, you couldn't get past the Milwaukee Bucks, so what did you do? Oh, I just signed with them the next year. It'd be like Bird becoming a Laker or... Magic becoming a Celtic. The whole thing is weird. Um, but speaking. Yeah, introduce our guest. Of the NBA, we have a guy who wrote a, uh, a book about some interesting things that have gone on in the NBA. Tim Livingston, everybody, who is uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. We, so there was confusion. Andrew and I were talking about that offline. I, we did a podcast on the NBA, not wrote a book. So. Oh, I thought it was a book. Yeah, he's got a podcast. Uh, he's got a podcast called Whistleblower. Who fixed the NBA? This is the biggest scandal in sports history that I got to be honest with you. I got whispers of, but it wasn't. It wasn't laid on to me like the way that was the Black Sox scandal. You know, like, and I know that it's as big, if not bigger than that. It got swept under the rug. I feel like a little bit. And I, and I got to be honest, with you, I want to start here, Tim, because I don't want to get right into it. But I'm curious. I stopped watching the NBA. I, when, I, when I got older than the players, for some reason, I no longer could enjoy it. When I was a kid and I looked up to them, I was there. I was like Magic Bird, Jordan, Isaiah, Dominique Wilkins. I was really into basketball. And then all of a sudden, when I got old, like Sean Kemp's the last player, I was like, ah, I love that dude. And then all of a sudden, I became their age, and I was like, eh. How, did you, how do you feel about that, Tim? Well, it's this year's draft. All the kids were born in two thousand or two thousand and one, which is truly bizarre. Um, yeah, right. But yeah, I grew up a huge basketball fan. I grew up in Los Angeles. I was a Lakers fan, and kind of became disillusioned with the NBA in, in similar ways that you guys did as I got a little bit older. Um, but the big thing for me, and this is what the story is about, is the dis the disillusionment really came from basketball being way too close to professional wrestling and that's what we dive into in this podcast is how how close was it the fine line between entertainment and a true athletic competition you know did they deviate along that line and that's that's kind of what this story is about well Well, I gotta tell you I felt like in the 2000s people used to think I was a conspiracy theorist I was watching games and I'm going these games are fixed And people said, you're out of your mind. I remember, clearly remember, I went to a Utah Jazz game. The Celtics were in town. I was doing a gig or something. I went to the game. And, you know, if the ref's calling it close, they're calling it close. Or if they're letting them play, they let them play. But this was like civil. They were doing both for, like, chunks of the game. Seven minutes, they're letting them play. Another seven minutes, they're calling everything. And I was just like, this, this is like they, they're, they're switching off officiating things. And um, I also felt overall that that Celtics-Lakers thing that happened organically that then led us into the Bulls made that, that league pass everybody. And then they have tried to finesse. I wouldn't say autumn, like fix, but they did everything they could because those were basically two super teams through the drafts and a couple of shrewd trades. Like Robert Parrish was a shrewd trade. Um, and, it, it, like, and I feel like ever since then, they have been looking for the, uh, the, the, the Celtics-Laker thing again, to the point I think they looked the other way with the Kevin Garnett trade. 
where we got him for nothing and Kevin McHale was in the front office. And then all of a sudden the Celtics went from nothing to being in the two years in a row with the Lakers in the finals or the final, whatever you call it. We win in, in 08 or something like that. And then in 09, like that was like a grudge match with the refs and Rashid Wallace. And they were calling like reputation fouls in, in a game seven. They were letting their Beyonce diva bullshit with this guy get in the way of the two franchises, which are the NBA. And I watched the Lakers beat the Celtics, taking unguarded free throw shots, like something like 35 to like 15. And I, I, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just felt like it, it sort of, it just became like let's. And then LeBron going to the Heat and how much they hated that. And, but everybody watched because they wanted him to lose. Then it became like the villain in wrestling. So then it's like, hey, let's let Durant go to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the Warriors, which that season was just like a bad summertime movie. You knew what was going to happen from the very beginning. So that's, that's kind of what happened with me. But No, um, and you're right. And, <laughs> you no, know, you're right. Because, Bill, the big, the big word, and it's not a con- – what I say is after our investigation, if you listen to all 10 episodes of Whistleblower, conspiracy theory, you can drop the word theory. There was a conspiracy here. And it went up to, during the Donahue scandal, it went up to the highest levels of government that made this thing go away. Because in 2007, 2008, there was an FBI investigation where they were going to wire up Tim Donahue and he was going to call every referee in the NBA and say, hey, when Dick Bavetta referees a game six or a game seven, does he have a motive? Does he want a certain team to win? And does the NBA want a certain team to win? And if you look at the 2002 Western Conference Finals, between the Lakers and the Sacramento Kings, game six, that was the most egregious officiating in the history of the NBA. I mean, Ralph Nader wrote a letter to David Stern afterwards. Michael Wilbon and every basketball pundit out there said, said as much, but there was no proof, right? Until Donahue came out and, and laid it all out. Um, however, the NBA was able to say, well, Tim Donahue is a criminal, which he was. He committed the cardinal sin. You know, he was fixing games himself. Um, but that's why this is such a fascinating scandal. It's if you have two eyes and you understand basketball, you understand that something was happening here. And what the NBA has tried to do, Bill, you're right, is create storylines. Who's going to sell more tickets in 2002, Chris Webber and Vladi Divac or Kobe Bryant and Shaq? And that's, that's really what this comes down to is over the last 20, 30 years, over the David Stern era, how many of these games were rigged? And according to our investigation, if you really look at the stats and you talk to the players who played in the game, we interviewed Rashid Wallace, we interviewed Bonzi Wells and Nate Robinson and George Carl and a bunch of other NBA figures. And look, the NBA is always going to have plausible deniability. Re- refereeing in general is the most subjective art form in, in the world. Like anything can be a foul or nothing can be a foul. Um, you can let them play or, or call, call everything. But at the end of the day, you know, are, were these games rigged? Was there a conspiracy or, or is it all conjecture? Is it all theory? And in my opinion, there was a conspiracy here. And I remember seeing Kevin Garnett. I think he might have been playing with uh, uh, Brooklyn Nets or something like that or whatever it was. No, he was, he, was, he, he was with Brooklyn at the time talking about when he was playing with the Celtics and they played somebody, I forget who, but he goes, we were not part of the NBA script that year. It was the closest I ever heard. I mean, it was like boxing. It's, I, I actually, you know, I think it's like painfully obvious that how they were almost bankrupt in the Lakers-Celtics rivalry, rivalry saved them, that that then became their business model. Once Jordan all of a sudden retires in 2008, what are we going to do? And they had the Spurs, but they lacked the star power sort of thing people said that they were boring or whatever and like i mean i think that there's just sort of an unwritten rule that the lakers have to be good that they they, that like they just gotta set they just funnel this is pipeline of free agents that just goes there it doesn't make any sense to me that like anthony davis doesn't stay with new orleans and then they get Zion, and then their fans get to enjoy a run. Like this whole thing where it's just like um, that they're, one of their main cornerstones is the Lakers. 
Yet they also abandoned New York Knicks. I don't know. It's a weird run league. But I, I do think just as far – it's a shit league for a fan unless you live in, like, certain markets. Um. They're ba- I mean, they've, I, is it me? They're basically telling Pelican fans to go fuck themselves, that you're essentially a professional farm team. Yeah, and that's... Well, can, I, can, I, can I jump in for one second? I'm super lost. <laughs> I, I, can we start it at page one and kind of tell me, because I heard Bill say that about the Lakers and the Celtics, and that does make sense. So, so what you're saying is... Say you say it, Tim. I'd love to hear you. I, no, tell me I'm, what happy. I I'm happy. Let's let's go back to the beginning. So, okay. I mean, Bill's right. The NBA was almost the point of insolvency in the '80s uh, when David Stern took over. He was blessed in 1984 with Michael Jordan being drafted and the Celtics and Lakers creating this fantastic rivalry. Um, and from there, you know, we saw the Pistons in the in the late '80s, and um, obviously. Jordan's Bulls after that. There was this great NBA storylines. There was great drama. Um, but if you look at specific games, I'm not saying every NBA game was rigged throughout the course of history in the NBA. That's, that's ridiculous. That's not true. However, the NBA, I think David Stern, particularly as a businessman, realized, Bill, to your point, I mean, Stern was asked by Dan Patrick, what is your ideal NBA finals matchup? Do you guys know what he said? What? No. Lakers versus Lakers. <laughs> so there's there's been this and, and just saying that if you're an NBA referee and you hear that and the Lakers are playing the Jazz in the Western Conference Finals and it's game seven and there's a 50-50 block charge call, you know, tie game fourth quarter with Kobe Bryant driving the basket, does that not is that not gonna influence the guys? Of course it is, right? So going back, there's you know, David Stern, just think of him as a puppeteer and think of the referees as you know, I guess we're going from puppeteering to chess, but they were uh, essentially, you know, his pawns and in, in making sure that certain teams advanced to the NBA finals. In 1993, this was a game that wasn't even on my radar. Lifelong NBA fan. I went on this crazy journey with Tim Donahue and, and became friends with Tim Donahue. And that's how I got all this information, which we can get into. But in 1993, I'm interviewing George Carl. And the game seven of the two of the 1993 Western Conference Finals, it was Suns with Charles Barkley versus Bert, your your boy Sean Kemp and the Sonics. Do you know how many? I I forget if it's it's 64. The Suns shot 64 free throws in game seven, and it was the most. You know, people on Twitter after we came out of this podcast have you know hit me up and said you know you you were probably too young for that game. That was the most ridiculously fucking officiated game in the history of, of basketball. And it was atrocious. And George Carl in game seven of the Western Conference Finals said he almost got thrown out in the first quarter and just kind of had to sit down and, and, and watch knowing that this game was going to be rigged. And so in the early 2000s, it got really bad because the Lakers were, were the team. And in 2000 against the Trailblazers, um, Shaq and Kobe had been together at that point for several years. They obviously had chemistry issues, and the Lakers had that amazing comeback from 15 points down in the fourth quarter. And look, Portland missed a bunch of shots in that game, but man, there were some really bad calls. And the Lakers ended up winning that title, and they won in 2001. And then in 2002, they were um, the second best team in the league, the Sacramento Kings, and and won that title behind, again, the worst and most corrupt officiating in in any sport that I've ever seen. And, And I think most sports fans would agree with that. So it's this whole journey of, you know, what is basketball? Is it wrestling? Why should we care as fans? It, to Bill's point, it's a really tough it's a business. It's, it's a, a business. business and they need their stars. I think Kobe was Jordan's replacement and he needed rings. He needed yep. to be chasing this. You saw what happened to golf when Tiger Woods, you know, when his body broke down. And then when he comes back, you know, it, it, the ratings go through the roof. So it is like a star-driven thing. And, and, and basketball is the easiest game to fix because it's the only one. You can't in football, you can't put, you know, you can't put uh, uh, Russell Wilson on the sidelines. NBA, you can literally take guys out of the game. You just give them two quick fouls, you know, and oh, then they wow. got them on the bench. You give them another one. Now they got three. And then you won't see them until the second half. You give them that quick one. It's just, or at the very least, you, they, they're going to be playing more timid. Um, 
it's it's uh so then how, totally. how how did how did how did this how did david stern uh affect the the the, the officials did it was it i'm curious oh, that's a great question so according to tim donahy and really according this is what we did we went back and we read after the donahy scandal the nba um, commissioner report, it's the same as the Wells report or any other league sanctioned report. It's all bullshit, right? They, they hire a law firm. It's a law firm conducting an independent investigation when they're getting paid by the league itself. But that was called the Pedowitz report. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. And a big referee at the center of all this was a guy named Dick Bavetta. And Dick Bavetta was a guy that Tim Donahue said, again, <laughs> Bavetta was the top referee. Bill knows who he is. Boy, well, why I'm you, just what? like, hey, Dick Bavetta. Let me handle this. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm just hey, saying, stop. Italians always get pissed at those stereotypes, and here we are again. <laughs> you know what, though? I mean, we interviewed Michael Franzese, who is a former uh, capo in the Colombo family, um, known as the Yuppie Don, really brilliant mobster. And he said he had a bookmaking operation where he said he had two NBA referees on his payroll in the, ni- in the 80s and 90s. And neither one of them was Tim Donahue. So there's only 57 guys in the league. You know, he's based out of New York. I don't, you know, he's, he's Italian. Just saying. Um, Dick Pavetta, though, is a really interesting character in all this. Because he was, if you look at all the controversial games, and Bill Simmons has written about this, and countless other NBA writers and, and journalists have talked about it. But to Bill's point, it's like you can't really talk about it if you're an NBA beat writer because then you're never going to be allowed in a locker room. You're going to be blackballed from, from the league. So this thing, it's always been this unknown or this known thing that people just don't talk about. Players talk about it behind closed doors. You know, Rasheed Wallace would look at a box score and be like, it, it, depending on the three reps, he'd be like, oh, we're going we're gonna to lose today. <laughs> like, a, I'm going to get two fouls in the first quarter. I'm going to sit on the bench. Wow. And they want the Lakers to win this game, clearly, because it's Dick Pavetta, Joey Crawford, and Steve Jaffe are repping this game. So, Having said that, he also did – he didn't do himself any service the way he treated the refs because I no. think that happens in baseball too. If you show up a home plate umpire, I mean, if you don't make good on that, like the rest of your at-bats, you're going to have a tough night every time that guy is calling your game. They're humans, right? And because they're humans, you know, is it impossible to manipulate a referee? And the answer is no. And so, Bert, just to go back to your question with Dick Pavetta – what Donahue said is that there was company men referees in the NBA who were very open about being assigned to certain games to procure certain outcomes, uh, produce certain outcomes. So that's what Donahue said. And when he said it, I heard it as a young journalist. and I was like, that makes sense. And that's where this all started. I wrote an article where I said, hey, uh, it's been, it was five years after the scandal but I, all I said was, hey, I kind of believe what Tim Donahue is saying about the NBA. It, it adds up. And that's where Tim Donahue reached out to me because I was the first person to ever say anything publicly about this guy that wasn't – he's a, a crook and a scoundrel. Um, and he and I formed this very bizarre friendship. And he's told me stories which I haven't been able to, to – tell. I can't say a lot of it on the record, but there's a referee um, during the Bulls era who, whose mistress was in Chicago. And so he used to referee games, win or lose. This wasn't Donnie. It was another referee, win or lose, to get back to Chicago so he could, you know, have intercourse with his mistress. Like that was – so NBA games were getting manipulated so a guy could get laid. It was the Wild Wild West. It was, it was a complete shit show. And the NBA knew it, and they didn't care. Guys had drinking problems, drug problems, um, and, and David Stern didn't care because – it got to a point where he needed these referees to produce certain outcomes because Michael Jordan was retired and the Lakers and Celtics weren't the Lakers and Celtics. And so if you look at the NBA in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s, it, there were some games that were really bad, really, here's really a, bad. Here's a question I have because the referees make way, 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 way less money than these players. How much do they make? Now, so now you're trying to get them to, what'd you say, Bart? How much does a referee make? It depends. So junior referees, it's it's tiered. Um, anywhere between now, probably one hundred fifty thousand dollars to the the top guys make close to a million dollars, and they make a huge amount of money based on their playoff and finals bonus checks. So basically, 
the more games you you can double your payday as a senior referee by working a ton of playoff and finals games. And so this goes back to the problem. How do you work? It starts making sense. This how starts do, making work? a lot of sense. So that's how they pay him. Because I was going to say, you know, if they're making shit money and then they're sitting on this big thing that the NBA's fixed, what's stopping them from being like, I'll just go to TMZ, get one big fat check and leave. So what they do is they give them a long career. You're a company guy. God, how, no. do you, how do you stop them from going Jose Consenco after they retire and go, it's he brilliant. was doing it and he was doing no, it? It's how do brilliant. You do it? They, this is, so this is what the NBA does. The, the NBA keeps them on the payroll forever. So the NBA, if you look at all the guys oh, I'm talking shit. about. Oh, shit. Shut they're, up. They're, fuck they're, up. They're, they're analysts on ES, – Steve Javi is an analyst on ESPN. Monty McCutcheon, Joey Crawford. All these guys are, are now the G League supervisor of officials. That, look, with, if, if – referee is the only thing on your resume what are you going to do when you retire right nothing like you're that's your job that's the only thing that you know it's your only experience in the workforce so you can't go unless you're donahy and get you know get blackballed that's all you can do so you, you've reached the pinnacle with the nba you do that for a long time and yeah and if you want to go write your expose david stern was smart and he said no we're going to keep we're going to keep paying you what what we're paying you until you die and so that's why none of these guys have ever come forward. They're all still on the teat. They're all still getting paid. So th this is really. like their, their pay girlfriends, like the NBA guys who are screwing around. They got their wife, and then they got their pay girlfriends. They just buy them shit, so they'll keep banging them. So the NBA also has pay girlfriends with the, the officiating is what you're saying. Allegedly, so we don't get Allegedly. 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 Um, wow, that's crazy. Because it now this makes – this makes like almost genius sense. You go, you go, hey man, I call the games that the commissioner likes and they're good games and the, and the big teams win and we help build stars and he's going to want me to be in the big games with those stars officiating the great game. I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like, uh, it, it's, it's problematic. It's like having a bartender that does shots. They sell a bunch of drinks, but they're also getting fucking wasted. Yeah, and these guys used to just – alcohol is, you know, as part of this thing. These guys were drinking and gambling, casinos, and this was all known. This was part of the refereeing culture. These are blue-collar guys who all – and we get into this in the podcast. There was like 14 referees from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, all blue-collar blue -collar bros, and Donahue was one of them. And it, it, this wasn't well, America. How did he get caught? All of these guys are doing this shit – did, it was it because he went outside the NBA pay girlfriend thing and he tried to cheat on him with the mob? Like what yeah, happened? So, so what Donahue did was – so, again, we, we've talked to other people. Michael Franzese was the only one who was on the record. Again, former mobster who said he had two NBA referees just on his payroll fixing games forever, right? So well, hang on. Start here, start here, start here. T I, I, this is a, Bill has a great question. I want to hear that, but I want to know – tell me a little bit about Tim Donahue. Let's yep. start with Tim Donahue. I don't know. I know that he got busted. I'm assuming he's from Delaware County. <laughs> but, but tell me about Tim Donahue. So Tim Donahue started refereeing in 1994. And his, Tim Donahue's father was a college referee. His uncle was an NBA referee. Obviously, all hail from that same area around Philadelphia called Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Um, so Tim Donahue, at 27 years old, I believe, got his got – his foot in the door as a referee in the NBA and was a really good referee. Uh, according to most people, he was a hothead. Uh, most players and coaches say that from the get-go, this guy had, had an anger problem and had a temper. But for his first nine years in the NBA, we have no evidence that said that he was manipul manipulating games in any way. He, by all accounts, was just an up-and-coming referee. Um, and again, it, re referees get fired. If you're not good after nine years, you're going to, you're going to get canned. He was starting more playoff games. You know, he was, he was working his way up. Um, and then in 2003, he, again, this is, as we get into the podcast, you can only believe what Tim Donahue says. You got to take everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. Um, that being said, there's a lot that's public. There's a lot in the FBI, FBI files. There's a lot that it, when you do your research, you can corroborate and, and it's true. So he started, re he started gambling on games that he refereed and allegedly fixing them um, in 2003. So for, from 2003 to 2007, that's a long time. Tim Donahue was betting on games that he refereed. 
So that's 260 games during that period that this one referee had money on. So that's 260 NBA games that, uh, you know, whether, whether you want to say the word fixed or not, they were being manipulated against the point spread. Um, so that's, that's Tim Donahue in a nutshell. Tim Donahue got caught on a Gambino wiretap. And so what happened is towards around 2006, 2007, Donahue thought he was never going to get caught because this was so easy. This was not difficult. It's not difficult for an NBA referee if the Pistons are favored by five points over the Hawks to make sure that the Pistons win by seven instead of four. That's not hard. That's a really easy thing to manipulate. And he was winning, according to him, 80, but according to another, his co-conspirator, 90. So let's say like 90% of his bets, right? So that's not, you're not betting. You're just printing money. So he was doing this so for years. What kind of bookie keeps taking, who, what kind of bookie is going to take a, a, a bet from a guy who's refereeing the game unless they're in on it? So that's, so, so he that had, what it was. They were saying, hey, make sure the Pistons win by more than five tonight and we'll let you put, he's not even betting. They're just paying him to do it. A hundred percent. So he was getting paid again. He was, I think the big question with Donahue is how many people was he giving tips to and, and getting money from? So it wasn't Donahue. Again, this is pre internet gambling being what it is today. So there was guys in New York and Philadelphia who caught wind of the scheme and were kicking Donahue back money. Um, but Donahue was involved with a, with a really big bookmaker named Jimmy Batista. Um, and Batista moved, he was really a money mover. He wasn't a better, but he moved money for some of the biggest sports betters in the world. And he caught one of the scheme and approached Donahue. Um, and so basically what happened, long story short, Jimmy Batista had a pill problem and, and a cocaine problem, got caught up with the wrong guys, um, got, into, got into some serious seven-figure debt. And started yapping that, that, hey, don't worry, I'm going to pay you back. I, I got a referee in my hip pocket. FBI heard that. Mm-hmm. FBI put two and two together, realized that ref was Tim Donahue, and, and the rest is history. But Donahue didn't realize that the games that he was betting on, when, when the scheme got big in 2006, the games that Donahue was betting on, professional bookmakers were betting millions, millions of dollars per game in international markets, in Europe, and in the U.S. So when Donahue refereed a game, we're, we speculate that it was close to a billion dollars during the course of his scheme that moved just on this one guy's games. So he had no idea how, how big this got. And when he got caught and when the FBI got involved, he didn't know. He thought it was still reasonably small. He thought he would be making an extra, you know, God knows how much money every year for his entire career in the NBA. And this was a guy who was going to be refereeing. If he was still refereeing today, his peer, this guy named Scott Foster, and I'm Bill, I don't know if that rings a bell. Scott Foster is the top NBA official today. Scott Foster and Tim Donahue were best friends. They exchanged 134 phone calls at the peak of this scheme. And on the, on the phone that the FBI says Donahue was using for gambling, um, and Scott Foster is the top NBA official today. Never had to answer any questions about this. Um, the FBI came out, you know, this all came out. And this is the guy that we're trusting today to referee the most important games in the league. I remember when that came out and they just put it on him. I'm like, what about the rest of the guys that were doing the game with him? It's like, how long could I shave points Burt on a game before you kind of like, Bill's acting, is he having an aneurysm? Like, what is he doing over there? Like, you'd know what was going on. They always go, they always get it to the lone crazed gunman whenever there's like this level stuff that is involved. I, I, I'm so glad that uh, you, you're, I mean, my par- I was just called paranoid, a conspiracy theorist. Like, I, I just got totally disenfranchised with the whole thing. It just looked just so manipulated. Even, like, the whole creation of the super teams and, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know how when you watch a game seven – and you call 30-something fouls on one team and the other team only in the teens, unless the other team is just hacking the shit out of you. But if it's just pedestrian shit. Um, so I would think that then ESPN, everybody, because they're all making money off of it and making so much money off of it, that everybody just sort of shuts up, except maybe at the Christmas party when somebody has a few, and they just they, everybody just buys the myth and sells the myth that 
this one guy, this one guy, like, so you know, here's which, which, which I'm not saying that that couldn't happen, but he would get busted really quick. But he, so yeah, he was branded as David Stern. David Stern came out and just said repeatedly, rogue, isolated criminal, rogue, criminal, rogue, rogue, rogue. That was the word that was branded. And again, this is the NBA was brilliant, but here's what bringing up ESPN, Bill, I'm happy you did, because I don't want to give away to your audience too much of what happens to the podcast, but one interesting thing that happened. So the NBA's entire business, and this goes back to everything we're saying, a majority of the NBA's revenue comes from its TV contracts, right? It's an entertainment company. Um, you know, we're, they're trying to create the best possible TV product. And usually that entails um, the, the Los Angeles Lakers. That's why David Stern said his dream finals is Lakers, Lakers. That's the, that was just purely a, uh, Lakers were the highest rated team consistently um, when the NBA played a finals game. So that's all David Stern and was saying. That's also their business model. Fuck New Orleans because no one cares. Because 100%. we're not going to take the time to try and build this thing up. Right. It's fucked we'll let Kobe no say, I'm not playing in Charlotte and stick him in L.A. And then we'll let Shaq go there and Phil Jackson. Exactly. And then, and then we'll let the Celtics build up and get Kevin Garnett for nothing. I mean, I was just watching it going like, this looks like, this looks like they're trying to make Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> That's what like also... Teams. So what, what happened during the scandal, it's fascinating, is ESPN and Turner signed a $7.4 billion deal with the NBA in 2007, five days before the scandal came out. So David Stern learned about the scandal and realized that the biggest scandal in the league's history, one that could jeopardize his um, legacy as commissioner, one that could jeopardize the integrity of the league to the point where, again, you know, uh, conspiracy theorists and paranoid, like, those, those things wouldn't be, those were just, those would be commonplace, right? Everybody would feel exactly as, as you felt and as I felt during that era. Uh, so he signed a $7.4 billion deal with the leagues and didn't tell the leagues that this was about to happen. He knew that the scandal, the, the FBI informed Stern that the scandal was coming down the pike. Stern was like, okay, we'll do whatever we can to help in your investigation then he calls Turner and ESPN and says, hey, we're good to go on this deal, right? Okay, let's we'll sign, boom. And then five days later, the scandal gets leaked. Um, and, and again, what's, what's brilliant about the NBA PR strategy, uh, guess who leaked the scandal? I don't know. Who? The NBA. So we proved pretty definitively that the NBA knew that Donahue was going to wire up, that he was going to go around the league and get all these officials to talk, not knowing that they're being recorded, about things that are that happened, that these referees were manipulated. Oh, so, the league so was corrupt. So wait, and, the NBA, the NBA was like, "Fuck Donahue telling my narrative. I will tell my own narrative. We'll leak the story. You're not gonna fucking rat out all our fucking rats. Shut the fuck up." <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. We got Blue Nile. Blue Nile. Blue Nile, baby. Not the red one. Blue Nile. At BlueNile.com, you can celebrate all of life's special moments, from creating the custom engagement ring of her dreams to gifting a once-in-a-lifetime piece, all at prices you won't find at a traditional jeweler. Um, are you looking for a gift that sparkles this holiday? Yes. Well, you're in control, Bert, at BlueNile.com. Is it time to mark a special occasion, Bert? It is. Oh, from engagements to anniversaries and birthdays, you need a trusted, no pressure, online jeweler to help you craft the perfect piece. Create, build the, uh, build the engagement ring of her dreams, not your dreams, certainly not your wallet's dreams, but her dreams. Never settle. At BlueNile.com, choose, uh, choose from more than 100,000 ethically sourced, Bert. No blood diamonds. No blood diamonds. These are free-range diamond pickers. GIA graded diamonds in every shape and size with an endless selection of settings to help you design the ring of her dreams. Her dreams. Blue Nile has simple, <laughs> simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity as well as the uh, setting style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then build your perfect engagement ring. Each is one of a kind or celebrate. Life special moments with fine jewelry. Nice. Hey, hey, Bert, you got a birthday coming up? How about a nice pinky ring from Blue Nile? 
Blue Nile I've got, is now I've got, offering I've got an anniversary selection. coming up. Oh, you do? Yeah, right, December 27th. Well, maybe you should go to BlueNile.com because right now they are offering an exclusive selection of Lightbox lab grown diamond fashion jewelry. Oh, this is this thing. We got to get a Lightbox, Bert. Start making jewels. Yep. Uh, this premium product line was released just in time for the holidays and makes a memorable gift. Blue Nile's Lightbox lab-grown collection includes new and exclusive styles of earrings, pendants, bracelets, and rings, accessibly priced at, uh, and set in 14 karat gold. Give them the oh, give the gift of premium lab-grown diamond fashion jewelry. Lightbox lab-grown diamond fashion jewelry is priced at at just $800 per carat. That's roughly one fifth the cost of a natural diamond jewelry at the same quality. Oh, I love it. That's beautiful. She'll, she'll never know, everybody. So celebrate your love and life special moments with jewelry from BlueLion.com. And Bill Burt listeners get 50 to $500 off. The podcast exclusive is only good through December and includes engagement. Uh, uses code, use code Bill Burt. That's Bill Burt, B-I-L-L-B-E-R-T. Plus, every, other, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in a discreet package that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever place. Go to BlueNile.com today. Nice. Manscaped. Long. You ready, Andrew? Manscaped. Support for the Bill Burt Podcast comes from Manscaped, who is the best in men's grooming below the belt. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Jingle balls to the walls, fella. Listen up. Untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. It's time to gear up and get yourself the gift of shaving this holiday season. And I'm talking about Manscaped, the perfect package 3.0. That's why this revolutionary company, Manscaped, has redesigned the electric, electric trimmer. Their, their lawnmower 3.0 has a proprietary advanced skin safe technology. So this trimmer cuts on your nuts. Yep. It's also waterproof, so you can use it in the shower. The Lawnmower 3.0 comes inside their brand new Perfect Package 3.0, which makes a perfect gift. Did I just read the same sentence again? <laughs> the Lawnmower 3.0 comes inside their brand new Perfect Package 3.0. Which a lot of 3.0s. A lot of 3.0s for the perfect gift this holiday season. It's literally everything you need to keep trimmed and cut free. And to smell nice down there, you can... And you don't end to smell nice down there. <laughs> <laughs> Come and, on, Bert. You got one paragraph left. And you don't use the same trimmer on your face as you do on your balls. That's just nasty. The Manscaped Perfect Package 3.0 also includes Crop Preserver. That's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. You already put deodorants on your armpits, don't you? Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? And yes, your balls stink. Speaking of sweaty and stinky balls, I'm thankful for their Crop Reviver. This product, along with the Crop Preserver, keeps your balls from sweating, smelling, and sticking. <laughs> and these products smell so good. Their manly scent is attractive. <laughs> Help set the mood for, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the perfect package will also come with a pair of Manscaped boxers that'll keep your junk fr fresh Feeling fresh all day. It's time to upgrade from those overused pair of boxers to Manscaped's high-performance anti-chafing boxers. Tis the season to get Manscaped, so get yourself, your dad, your brother, and your best friends all the gifts of the best of the Manscaped Perfect Package 3.0. Get 20% off plus free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash Bill Burt. Your balls will thank you. Remember, get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com slash Bill Burt. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com, manscaped.com slash Bill Burt. Clean up your nuts and make Santa proud this year. So it's, that's, and again, this, it kept, it keeps going up. And if you look at, there were some very odd dealings in the court um, that, that it make, it made it seem, in my opinion, that David Stern and all of his big New York lawyer friends, um, the district attorney's office included, really wanted this thing hushed up, wanted these guys to take their plea deals, go, go away for a little while, 
and for this thing to go away. So it kept, it keeps going up. And that's what we break down in whistleblower is holy shit. This wasn't just a couple basketball games. This, this, this was a systematic problem within the you NBA. Think, you think they're going to get away with it? I mean, it feels like they did. And I, I went on a sports show yesterday or a couple days ago, and it was in basically a, an NBA one. And all they were talking about was the draft. And, you know, during the off season, does this big piece, move to here and does this go over there and uh, I just I, I was just joking saying I think the NBA stinks and <laughs> I, I just I mean I didn't talk about it being fixed because I didn't realize it was you know what you're what you're saying allegedly. that's what you guys so like we released this podcast our, our final episode came out at the end of October so it's still a pretty new podcast and, and at this point where our downloads are into the seven figures um, you know I've been on a bunch of you know, Dan Patrick and Dan Levitar and a lot of shows and, and a lot of people have listened to this. I know at the ringer at ESPN at all. Right. So people know what we found and know, know what the investigation, you know, they, they know what uh, everything I'm telling you guys is in the podcast. So, and this is everything I'm telling you guys is just, you know, these are small pieces of a huge conspiracy. So I've reached out to the NBA for comment. They've remained mum, And I'm just sitting really? here like, yeah, I'm like, I'm sitting here. I'm like, do I, do I have to talk to Bill and Bert for, for fucking people to realize that this happened? This was a conspiracy. The NBA has been rigging games for years for its for the entire Davis turn You have to look at every – and not every. You have to look at a lot of NBA finals with a huge asterisk. And it's a shame because as sports fans, Bill, you're just watching the Patriots game before you came in. What if, what if we told you that – Oh, as a Patriots fan, it's probably not the best example. But <laughs> uh, I'm a. <laughs> oh, are you going with that again? I love how we're talking about an entire league that cheats and everybody. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm tell you hey. so. That is the genius of Jim Ursay. A I'm not a hey. drug addict with a dead mistress who hired I'm a not, guy whoa, who whoa, wasn't a scientist. Right. Backtrack. I, I've been. I've publicly. I think Deflategate is the biggest joke ever. I was just saying because so you guys the judge. Work. That's why he fucking threw it out. But the genius though is, is it got enough press by ESPN and all of them that people think it's 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 like a true thing, and it's it's um, it's the genius of the pettiness of uh, Jim Mercer. Yeah, but uh, but another fascinating element of Deflategate is was Goodell and the the Wells report. I mean, that was the biggest joke. I mean, the, the entire charade around that, and you have to wonder, uh, you know, was that just the NFL doing what the NBA did? Wanting to create a storyline, wanting to brand the Patriots as the villains so that the other... No, I think what it was was you, the fact that the Patriots fought it and beat it in court was this big thing of like, oh, shit, mommy and daddy just got defeated by one of our kids. We can't have that. So what they did was they found a loophole is they went back after the judge. The judge was like pissed, going, why are you wasting my time with this horse shit? There's nothing here. And then remember, he was fine. And then they brought it back again. They said, uh, is the, their argument was, is the NFL a corporation? The judge said, yes. Does a corporation have the right to suspend an employee? They said, yes. And they said, well, is Tom Brady our employee? Yes, he is. And they said, fine, he's suspended. So what they did was they then went like in-house with it and they, they use that loophole to suspend him. But everybody who, you know, Tom Brady, the good-looking guy with the model, went in all the rings, hated his fucking guts, so they went with the first narrative of it. Yeah. And most of them are golfers, where Bert will tell you, some of the biggest fucking cheaters on the planet with their breakfast balls and all of that mulligans and shit. <laughs> Got to listen to those fucking That's assholes. Well, Banker you know, you playing brought... golf is going to tell me that fucking the Patriots cheat. Okay, buddy. Well, you, brought up, you brought up Tiger Woods. You know, Tiger Woods, I forget, I think it was in the mid-2000s, but during his um, physical evolution, ordered $250,000 worth of something from Anthony Galea, who is the foremost HGH doctor. He's the guy that all the baseball players and all the football players went to for HGH. And that's public that Tiger Woods ordered two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of something from Anthony Galea, PRP um, shots or, or something that he claimed that he. That well, he hey, had. there was another guy who played for another team that no one gave a shit about, and for some reason his wife ordered a bunch of that shit that went to the house. His wife, yeah, she hurt her back taking the dishes out of the dishwasher, and she needed some. Uh, yeah. She needed I mean, some steroids, but for some reason ESPN just did not find that story interesting. I. 
you know, that's a different debate because I think HGH, you know, if you're a professional athlete, you better be doing HGH or else like that's, that's a completely different argument about whether it's legal or not. And if we're talking about cheating, if you're taking a substance like that, but I understand that guy doesn't play for the Patriots. So by all means, defend him. You know what? I'm done with this podcast. <laughs> all, I can say, all my takeaway from this podcast, Bill, more dudes with glasses on our podcast. This is fucking awesome. I love when people know what they're talking about. I this is so that. fucking interesting, man. I know. I appreciate it. Well, Mark, don't think you don't. I, I I didn't notice how frustrated with you that I just went into my opinions and went to the end of the story that you had to pretend <laughs> that you were confused because you didn't want to say, Bill, this isn't how you do an interview. Shut <laughs> up and start at the beginning. <laughs> Bill, well, Bill, and, and I, bringing up the Patriots, that was that was my bad. Bert, I apologize. No, 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 no. We'll get back. We'll get this back on track. No, no. I have a question. I how just out of curiosity for like say someone that doesn't know a lot about basketball. How 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 did he cheat? Did he say, "All right, I'm gonna put uh, the the spreads five on the Lakers. I'm gonna let them play the first. I'm gonna I'm gonna let I'm gonna let it. Maybe I won't cheat. Maybe I will cheat. And then okay, it's getting bad. I need to get dot 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 out of the game. Is that how it worked? Yeah, so what's so fascinating about basketball is think about how easy it is if you're a referee to cheat within the rules. Everything's a foul. So if you want Kobe Bryant on the bench with two fouls in the first five minutes of the game, that's usually not that hard to do, right? Um, if you want to you know, call Allen Iverson for a carry on every possession, you can do that. So there was a lot of tools in, in Donahue's toolbox. So I, w- I went into this thinking that we would never find any proof on how Donahue fixed games because NBA refereeing is so subjective. Everything's a foul. And we had talked to guys like Franzis who said that this was easy. But what's really interesting is that Donahue's co-conspirator, Tommy Martino, and again, Bill, you'll listen to this podcast. I mean, the names, Martino, Batista. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm already seeing the Scorsese movie. It's, yeah. Hey, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. Maybe you can help me get Mar- hold of Marty after, uh, after this because Terrence Winter just passed on, on writing it, which he was a fan of the podcast, but I was, I was bummed about that. So anyways, um, Tommy Martino comes out and says that Donahue used the out-of-bounds line. That when a, when a guy that they – and, again, this was 13 years ago before there was as many cameras in, you know, in, in especially random games, Bert. So think about, like, Hornets versus Timberwolves in January. Nobody's watching that game. Nobody cares. Uh, but Donahue used to use the out-of-bounds line. If a guy was even close to out-of-bounds that, you know, so if they bet on a team and that team, the guy stepped out-of-bounds, Donahue would just, you know, pretend like he didn't see it. It, the other team, if they got remotely close to the out-of-bounds line, blow the whistle, go the other way. So it was like – yeah, that's yeah. what pissed me off because I was like, I was like, damn it, Donahue, you're, you're that brazen? You didn't have to do that, right? It's just a few fouls. And, again, what's interesting for me, it doesn't – the fourth quarter is the worst time to do it. That's when the most eyeballs. It's the first quarter and the second quarter that I think it's the easiest time if, if you have a bet on a game to manipulate that game. You get, the, you get the star player of the bench, bam. Uh, early second quarter, you know, you can call three or four BS fouls. You know, the, the fans are going to boo, but nobody's really going to be thinking about that in the fourth quarter of this game. So Donahue's tactics, again, it was easy. It's easy for a referee to manipulate a basketball game, which, again, today in 2020, that's why we still have to watch all these games with that paranoia, with the, the same attitude of, man, is this, is this real? Is this an even playing field? Is this a meritocracy? Does the best team win every year? Or are we watching choreographed ballet? Well, I can just say that I think everything is fixed and manipulated. And it's what I can't say. There was somebody I knew who I really liked, really respected, was trying to say that there is no they. And it's like, there's always an end. There's always they. There's always this whole country came about. We conspired to get the British out of here. You know, we, we, the, the whole thing is you go into a, 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 a bar when you're a single guy and you want to get laid. You and your buddy, you come up with a game plan. You're conspiring to get some pussy. This just – dude, my, and I had friends of mine, they, they coached Little League, and there was always one dirtbag that had some sort of inside line on the best fifth graders that were coming in, even at that level. And I just think – I really have to say that, that to find out that these leagues – are manipulated um, 
is not surprising, I guess. And I think it's the NBA sold their soul to the super team and got themselves involved in this, where I think the NFL is just a better run league as far as um, – because anybody can win, it's sort of they don't have like the Lakers kind of Celtics thing going on there. But I will say though, that that Saints no call on the pass interference was the I mean, it wasn't like it was away from the ball. The ball was going right there, and the guy was like, it's like that missed call at first base between St. Louis and in Kansas City. It was like that big of a margin. So I just think when there's billions of dollars at stake. There's going to be not only subsets of pieces of shit, then there's going to be the people running it who want to keep it running like, like 86, you know, 85, you know, 86 Celtics was our pinnacle. We want to stay there every year. What can we do to manipulate it? So, yeah, I don't know. I agree. Bro, were you going to say something? Uh, fuck. Um, yeah, I just forgot my question. It said he was he was he was at, at the um he was in the Pacers uh Pistons brawl. Yeah. Donna he was malice and palace too and, and got critiqued for not doing enough to calm that down. Ah. Uh, but he should he did, I mean, Tim I mean Donna he deserves kudos for that. That was an incredible, incredible moment in sports history. Uh, I know what I was gonna ask. I was gonna know what I was gonna ask. So Clearly, you got, there's a movie here. There's definitely a fucking movie here. How much money did the judge make Donahue pay in restitution so that he can't make any money off this movie? Uh, that's a good question. I know Donahue, a big thing for Donahue with, with Whistleblower, with our podcast being out, is that he doesn't want him to pay restitution anymore. Um, I, I believe it was in the six figures, not the seven figures, that Donahue has to pay the NBA back. Um, but if you look at... The rest from what gambling debts? No, isn't from, that illegal money earned? He has no, to give no, no. them money. Probably, probably from. I would imagine they'd sue him for services that he never rendered. They'd go, "Hey, we paid you five hundred thousand dollars a year, and you did not do your job. We want our money back." Right? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It's it has to do with his his role um, and his not performing in his duties as a referee, I believe. Um, but restitution, the NBA really really stuck it to Tim Donahue. And again, he, it's not like he didn't deserve it. It's not like, you know, looking at this scandal, you can look at Donahue and be like, oh man, you know, that guy was the scapegoat. He was, but he's a really good guy. No, Donahue, and again, I, I still consider myself a friend of Tim's, but Donahue um, is a schmuck and he knows it. And he's gotten a lot better. And he's uh, at this point in his life, he's got his, he's got a, you know, he's a good dad. We are with him and his family in Florida um you know he's got he's gotten it together he's like at 53 years old a little bit more of an adult and a little bit less of a schmuck but the nba it was so easy to bury this guy right and to bill's earlier question we, we it's not no other referee is ever going to come out and say like hey you know by the way uh donna he's right i was fixing games uh, uh, crazy i mean i can't believe nobody they Talk should have had video football. of him getting let out in a ref shirt and handcuffs going, oh, so I'm the Patsy, doing the, doing the Oswald walk. He, and then he, he gets the shot by a T-shirt gun as he comes out of the arena. <laughs> Donnie, and Donnie, he just refereed. For the, so the first thing that he's refereed since 2007 uh, was a wrestling match a month ago. So he got back into refereeing to do a wrestling match. And oh, that's great. That's, that's just a great a way in. It's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's full circle. And you got to just, again, the question is, how close is the NBA to professional wrestling? And I think any basketball fan, anybody who just loves sports, you know, it's, it's way too close for any of us to feel good about watching it. All right, I got two, two questions. One is if NBA players talk about this in private, what's to stop them once again from going Jose Consenco when they retire? Is it because they get the, the pension? Man, I so – we, a prominent, I've gotten through podcasts that I produce and things that I've written and done. I have this really robust network of NBA guys who played in the late nineties and early two thousands. And so, um, you know, Andrew and I were talking about a couple of those guys beforehand. And we heard a story that was, that we couldn't use in the podcast, but might've been the best story we heard about a game 
um, where this player played, and then in the fourth quarter of the game, Don, Tim Donahue was refereeing the fourth quarter of the game. He usually shot about 10 free throws a game, and he hadn't shot one uh, in this game. And they were losing to a team that they were better than, and he thought it was because of the referees. And he went up to Tim Donahue and he said, why the fuck are you cheating for them? And he told me this amazing story, and I was so excited to use it in Whistleblower. It was going to be in our pilot episode. It was going to be a big part of us explaining to the audience how fucked up the system was. And you know what happened? He said, I don't want to be a snitch. I don't want to, I don't want you to use it. Oh, that's and so, a big thing. That's a really big thing with every one of those kids that comes into the NBA, the African-American kids. Snitching is super frowned upon, whereas it was applauded in my family. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's also like it's, it's a way out, too. The NBA is a way out. And if you bring that whole thing down, I mean, everything else is a scam. Yeah. Banking's legalized loan sharking, so the NBA is is what it is. And I, I don't want to also like demonize the NBA like they're the only ones that have had you know, the, that whole baseball steroid scandal, like the owners didn't know what was going on. Or like I'm the owner of the Astros and, I, and I'm not standing there going like, I don't remember authorizing somebody drilling that hole <laughs> out in the center field wall there. What? What are those two young whippersnappers doing out there? Those two go-getters. They're taking it upon themselves to do something here? Like, I just know as like a comedian, like, you know, if, if there's a comic that's like uh, getting a little sideways with some substances and stuff, we all know. You hear the stories. So you knew it, it, owners of these teams, they know what's – I feel like they know what's going on. But um, hey, but the big owner who knew – the big owner who knew what was going on. Let me guess. Let me guess. Let me guess. Mark Cuban. Yes. Right. So Mark Cuban came into the league in 2000, bought the Mavericks. And for his first seven years in the league, obviously he's amassed over $2 million in fines. The guy has been outspoken about refereeing for his en entire career as an owner. But after the Donahue scandal, he was very suspiciously silent. And the Mavericks, we haven't talked about the 2006 NBA finals. In my opinion, after doing this research and talking to everybody we spoke with, the 2006 NBA Finals, which was the Heat versus the Mavericks, where the Mavericks won the first two games in the series, and then Dwayne Wade shot, I believe, 84 free throws. I don't want to get that number wrong. It's, like, it's around 80 free throws over the last four games of that series, and game five was a blowout, and Wade only shot like 13. So Dwayne Wade just started – it was just a procession to the free throw line, where Dwayne Wade was like, oh, hey, Dwayne, do you, you drive? All right, yeah, just take two, right? So that was a big – I watched that series in college, and I had no – I don't – couldn't care less about either of those teams, but it was the same thing, Bill, where I was watching that game being like, is anybody going to talk about how the refereeing in this is completely slanted? I mean, Dwayne Wade – he kept his mouth shut after the scandal, so they gave him his title in 2010 and yep. let that team beat the, the Heat is what you're saying. I, I, oh, my God, what? Bert. My brain's melting over here. My brain's Mark, melting. Mark Cuban, Mark Cuban bought the Mavs for $285 million, And it, it's all money, right? So Cuban bought the Mavericks for $285 million, complained about refereeing, but David Stern kept signing big TV contracts. And by 2007, when this came out, and they signed that $7.4 billion deal, the Mavericks were a billion-dollar team. So is Mark Cuban going to come out and say, hey, um, I was right. The referee, this is all rigged. This is all bullshit. No, he couldn't. So Mark Cuban is somebody but that... he wasn't saying it was rigged. He was just bitching, saying the officiating was bad. Yes, you're right. He wasn't, he wasn't saying it was rigged. But if you ask him about the 2006 NBA Finals, he's going to say that they got screwed. And if an owner says that his team's got screwed, isn't that the same thing? Like, he won't use the word rigged. He won't well, use the word there's, rigged. there's blowing calls. And, the, dude, there's a big difference between, you know, there's... I think there's a difference between the officiating sucked to well, that was a home job to, okay, this is a straight up fucking, we decided before the game even started. I mean, um, there is, you know, to play a little bit of a devil's advocate, there is the human element where there are certain players that referees just don't like. Oh, hundred percent. Smart 100%. guys are the ones that stay on their good side. And, no, and that's and they're human and that's a game but to your you know when you look at the pass interference in the ram saints game for example that's one call that's a spur of the moment it was a terrible non-call one of the worst in sports history but it's one call if you look at 
the 2002 Western Conference Finals, the 2000 Western Conference Finals, the 2001 Eastern Conference Finals, and the last four games of the 2006 NBA Finals, it was call after call after call after call after call, right? This, it wasn't just one spur of the moment bad call. And I think that's what makes these games different. If you watch them in, in their entirety, you're just, as a fan, like, right. there's, there's something wrong here. That oh, it, wow. It so to actually know, like, the suspicious games and then go back and watch them must be – So do you think – okay. So do you think that they let the Celtics win with the big three because the Spurs thing was dying down, Kobe was getting older, let's get the Celtics Laker, like, 20 years later, they're doing it again as a little placeholder – as LeBron goes to Miami, or is this one of these things that now I know what happened, I'm just doing the beautiful mind, day. Hey, this fits here, and I'm just putting it all together with this, this, this uh, sinister slant to it. I don't, yeah, the, the 08, I, I think Boston, from what I remember, and I watched this, there's nothing in, in 08 that seemed like the, the NBA. Boston had a great team. Kevin Garnett knew that. Yeah, but we were in last place the year before. Then all of a sudden we get Kevin Garnett for nothing with Kevin McHale in the front office. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. The offseason offseason is highly suspicious, right? Whether uh, Kevin McHale was talking with the Celtics front office saying like, hey, guys, look, you know, we're – Garnett wants out. We're not going to be good for a long time. Like, why don't we just find a way to get Kevin Garnett to you guys because I'm still a Celtics fan at heart. The, the offseason was highly suspicious. I don't think there's anything refereeing-wise that year that I remember, you know, that was particularly egregious. And I don't think there – if you look – I think it's like 90% of NBA Finals victors over the last 30 years, maybe eh, probably like 82%, were the legitimately were – the, were the best team in the NBA. It's right. not every team. But, man, the 09, the, the la- game seven of that – that was an ugly game. Uh, where the Lakers beat the Celtics. I, think, I believe that I was remember ugly. Kobe's quote. He's like, I don't know how we won that game. <laughs> that was that was ugly. And again, the Lakers, you're talking to a guy who grew up a Lakers fan, and the Lakers are so often the beneficiary of controversial officiating. They've never been on the wrong side of it. You know, the Heat in 2006, I mean, they were on the right side of it. So, by the way, with Cuban, this is what we look at with Cuban in that, that, that finals. Cuban wrote – right before the finals in May of 2006, a, a lengthy blog post, as he often does. The guy likes, likes you know, to let his, let his thoughts out there. Cuban wrote a blog post which said that refereeing, you know, I think they let 34 referees referee in the playoffs. Cuban, and that's how they make all their money. And Cuban said that only the nine or 12 best referees should referee the playoffs. They should referee every game. And that basically the refereeing system needs an overhaul and, and was telling the referees, I, I want you guys to all make less money off these playoff and finals bonus checks. And so do I think games three through six of the 2006 Western Conference Finals, I don't think, you know, this wasn't about getting the Lakers or the big market team or the big stars in the finals. I think the referees conspired to say, fuck you, Mark Cuban. Hey, they were sending them a message. It was. It was. It was and it's <laughs> fascinating because because Mark Cuban – he said he says you know, he says he felt like he got screwed, and if you watch those games, I I think he did. And then in 2011, again the Mavs played great. Uh, Dirk Nowitzki and Tyson Chandler and, and the rest of that team played really well. You know LeBron it was his first year with the Heat. Uh, they were kind of tight. They weren't really you know a dominant force yet. So I don't want to say that that was rigged for the Mavericks. But but the problem is that we can look at every single Finals in the history of the NBA and, and play that game. And it's, it's a game worth playing. I get what you're saying. You're not saying it's 100% of the time, but when the, the, the profit margins are dipping, then the manipulation starts to make sure that they're going to, that they're going to have, they're going to, the, the TV contract, we're going to justify why you're playing, paying us this. Cause we're, you know, we don't want to have like a Yankees Mets series where I'm, Oh, the subway series. And like, nobody gave a shit except people in New York. Like they, you can't you can't have championship series like that. Because especially, I would think that the pressure on the NBA with streaming and and the internet and and people taping games and blowing through, you know, they needed to make it be must see v, must see TV. When we got, I think that the same way. It's kind of funny our business, Bert. Where like back in the day, there was like 
you, if you got like two, three stars in one movie, that was incredible because everyone, there was so many different movies being made. And now it's just everything. It's just like these pile on movies because there's so many other options out there and there's so much less money sort of being divvied out yeah. um, that I think the NBA kind of got swept up in that too. Hey, what? It's a fucking business. What are you going to do? Business. Yeah. That's hey, it's what, what game I hate to keep going back to because um, the bigger picture of the NBA being involved in this collusion almost is, is fascinating, but what, but I, I, I keep going back to Tim because those are the ones I know, right? What what big games did I possibly watch that he fixed? Zero. And that's, uh, excuse me, in the 2000 and the Sun Spurs series in 2005, I believe, yeah. Tim Don- which is a really controversial, but that was the first round of the playoffs. Tim Donahue was involved in. But what's, what's crazy is that all the games that I've referenced over the course of our conversation um, were all refereed by Dick Pavetta, almost every single one uh, Dick Pavetta was involved in, uh, Steve Javi, Joey Crawford, uh, Bennett Salvatore, uh, just throw another great name out there. Um, like, Donahue didn't referee those games. None of them. Zero. And that's where if you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist um, like myself, then, you know, you're watching, you're, you're listening to what Tim Donahue said, and you're watching these games, and and it's really – easy to believe Tim Donahue. Uh, and again, after doing this investigation, I, I do, I believe what he says because he didn't referee any of those games. He was refereeing his scheme revolved around refereeing the most unremarkable games in the NBA. And yeah. those games moved millions of dollars. And if you look at, so we looked at the betting data from those games and you can tell, you know, if a lot of money is being bet by professional bettors on a game, Vegas, you know, the, the odds makers react, right? They move the line from, and I, I don't, we don't have time. If you guys want me to do a sports betting explanation, I'm happy to for your listeners. But, you know, if, if it's a two like point, the deep state of sports, <laughs> it is, it is because this is, this is it, So then you know, people in Vegas, if they're doing the odds, then they're whispering at the frame and there's a lot of money getting put on this fucking who gives a shit game in, uh, in, in, in fucking Seattle tonight, back in the day when the Sonics were there. Then everybody tries to jump on it. And then they move the odds? Yep. And so like a two-point favorite becomes a three-point favorite. And that means that there's a lot of money coming in. And, and that usually means that there's something going on, right? Um, maybe they, they found out about an injury. You know, star players a little banged up. Um, they were out in L.A. last night at the club. Uh, you know, whatever it is, right? They all have their tips. And, but during the Donahue scandal, we found out that one of the, the books – one of the offshore books where you place the bets knew about the Donahue scheme, knew that Donahue was manipulating games and wouldn't take bets on whatever game Donahue was, was refereeing. And they, the sports book, were betting at other sports books because they knew that Donahue was fixing games. So, I mean, this took a while. How could figure out which way he was going to do it? I'm not a big gambler. How could you figure, okay, Donahue's doing this game and I'm watching the line move. It goes from two points to three points. Well, then obviously they're trying to get me to take the other team, so I should, I should take the points. So it's a little more complicated than that because if – Damn Don, it. If Don, well, no, no, because they would do head fakes. They would fake – they would put a lot of money on the wrong side to make the line move a little bit, and then they'd put a shit ton of money on the right side at the very end and force all these books to, you know, to, to move the line even more in their favor and make it seem like all the money was there so they would take a lot more money on the right side. Um, so it gets a little complicated, but basically Donahue was telling so many people and then they were telling so many people and it just spiraled out of control oh, to dude. where we, yeah, we don't know I, how many people we knew, but a lot did. We were in the Poconos once at a bar and someone, someone, someone's dad had a line on a horse and, uh, and I swear to God, I mean, 20 people must have gone into this. At, at this one bar, it spread at this one bar, and everyone went to OTB and put money on this fucking horse. And, and I won? Uh, yeah, I won. And we put money on him, too, me and my buddy Eddie. Yeah. That's it. If you get a tip, I mean, that's, and that's what Donahue – and, again, Donahue had a, uh, a bag man, a middleman named Tommy Martino. He was giving the tips to Baba Batista, who had a huge coke problem and was, you know, z- zonked out of his mind on pills. They were all telling people. Donahue was telling people. And that's how he got caught, right? And just so many people knew about this thing by the end. 
including the Gambino crime family, the most prominent crime family in, in New York. I heard they're so, all legit now. Yeah. Yo, I mean. I don't want to get in trouble here, man. I, yeah, no. no big fan of the Gambinos. Big fan of the Gambinos. No, the Gambinos, like, I'm sure if, if any Gambinos listen to Whistleblower, I mean, we're very complimentary of they didn't do anything wrong. They just they just caught wind of the scheme. They were betting in legal markets by all by all accounts. And <laughs> they, they, Dude, I heard it in that movie Casino that when they kept going our friends in Kansas City, they were actually talking about the Chicago mob, but they didn't want to have any fucking problems. So like, yeah, what'd you say they're in Kansas City? There you <laughs> go. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to make truth. somebody. I got a tip. I got an anonymous tip. I don't. Yeah, I don't want to make any the Gambinos. Um, you know, respect across the board for all those for all the Gambinos who are listening to. Can I tell you the all part? The part of the, the, part of the conversation that I keep giggling at the most is what, at the very beginning when Bill goes. Um, so how, how did it, as a referee, how did he bet on these games? And I have this visualization of old school, like him walking into a bar with a stack of bills in his referee outfit and putting it on the table and go, I'd like to take Pelicans. And they're like, man, this guy from Foot Locker really knows his basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and that's the thing. He was so, I mean, he was at least smart enough to have other people place the bets for him and he would just get kickbacks. But like Martino tells a story of, he went to meet up with Donahue in the Meadowlands with 40 grand in a fanny pack to hand it off. You know, um, it was just cash. Cash was going everywhere. And this guy was making, uh, he says he was only making um, 30, he said he only made $30,000 the last year of the scheme. I question whether that to be the, the actual number. Um, again, if you're winning 90% of your bets, it's not, you're printing money. Like that's not, I, you just keep you keep going back to that well because it's like you guys doing shows. I mean, it's like I don't know. You just you do a show, you yeah, make the money. Thing is so when you, you win keep... that kind of money, when you start when like you run out of places to hide it, that's that stuff. I was reading on like how the guys in the mob that was smart were always working towards getting onto the legal side of stealing, like being a banker or something like that, because these gangsters are doing the same scams but illegally. So now they got to put their money in the walls. They got to fucking act like they got a smaller house. And it just becomes a pain in the ass where the banker gets to drive down the street with all of his stolen money. But he's, he's letting all the IRS and everybody wet their beaks on it so he doesn't have to hide it. Dude, that shit is all fascinating, man. I, I got a list. How many episodes of, of, of Whistleblower is there? So there's 10 episodes. Each one's around half an hour, 40 minutes long. Um, you can find it wherever you get your podcast. But yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts once you get a chance to listen to it. It's um, we, we dive into we dive into Donahue. We start off with Donahue and his role in the scandal and him as a person and where he grew up. And, and it's all fascinating. And then the second half is where we get into the conspiracy. What did the NBA know? What, are the, what was the NBA doing? How did they make this go away? You know, how big was this cover up? And how high did it go? Has anybody, you, have you gotten any weird phone calls since you started to try to uh, be the whistleblower on this thing? Is your internet um, been cutting out? Have you noticed your laptop being turned on and you're not near it? You know what's funny is I'm talking to you guys. I, I lived in Los, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, lived there my whole life. And um, I got out right at the end of this thing. And uh, there, weren't, there weren't any black suburbans yet parked outside of, of my old apartment. But Part of me was like, I gotta get the hell out of LA. I'm too easy for a target right now, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide out right now, or you know, at, at an undisclosed location. But I, you know, again, this is fascinating. This podcast, me talking to you guys, I'm interested. You know, you guys have such an ardent following. If this will be another, I, I've been on several sport, big sports shows, but I'm just wondering, uh, especially on Reddit, Bill. I found a Reddit thread where it was like, oh, Bill Burr is, has outdated NBA takes and blah blah blah. And it just made me laugh because you know, I, knew I, I knew I was going to come on and talk to you guys about this. So it's interesting. Is this going to – I keep thinking, you know, where is the straw that's going to break the camel's back to where the NBA has to address this? Because what we revealed is incredibly damning about the NBA, and they can't hide from it. It's public now. So they, they've at this point been able, despite the success of, the, of our podcast, been able to avoid it. I mean, conveniently for them, the season wrapped right before we got to the – the big stuff at the, at the end of our podcast, the big interviews that really... What would have to happen is fans would have to become disillusioned with the game, and, and they're not. 
They're not. I think fans enjoy, um, you know, kids and stuff. Like, to them, the NBA is, you know, 10 stars on one team, 10 stars on the other. And then there's a couple of the okay teams and the other 26 can go fuck themselves. It's just their their idea of what the NBA is or how a sports league should be run. So I try not to be the grumpy old man, but I also got to say what 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 I am thinking. But um, I don't know. So now, okay, you guys want to predict? Predict who they're going to have. Uh, my thing now is that the Lakers tied the Celtics at 17. They can't just let the Lakers get 18. They got to play the Celtics in the final, you know? Who's going to get number 18 first? Clippers. The, the NBA want, has wanted the Clippers to be good for a long time. And now the Clippers obviously were good last year, and they blew it against Denver. Um, if you're looking for a team that is a really interesting team to bet on this year that the NBA, if they're in a game seven with the Lakers, might want to usurp the Lakers, um, the Clippers are a really interesting team to look at. Um, All right. I'm gonna, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet. I'm going to bet real low on every single Clippers game. I, I like it. I mean, Clippers. <laughs> and that is a really – I'm going to take uh, – let's, let's, how many games in a season? 82. 82. If I put $100, that's $8,000, right? If I, I'm going to take $8,000 – and I'm going to bet $100 on every single Clippers game. I like it. How it turn out. I mean, I probably will break even. But my my question is: is their golden goose is is what from what you're saying is the Lakers? Why would they want a competing? Um, that's Phil, in Phil, the Phil, same Phil. conference. It's a, it's Bill. I'll tell you why. This is my I might take. Um, if a corporate. If, if a corporation wants to get wants to hire one of us to do their corporate gig, we're big fans of the Bill Burt podcast. They go to you, your your price is going to be higher. And they come to me and they're like, well, we can get Burt. Maybe we'll see if we can get him to tell some stories about Bill <laughs> and do the show for half the price. I mean, right? It's a cheaper team than the it's, Lakers. And it's still, it's, it's still LA is such a huge basketball market. Um, so I think they see an opportunity. Again, this is – David Stern, before he passed, and while he was still commissioner, um, again, I have sources who have told me that he really wanted the Clippers to ascend to the top and, and be a rival for the Lakers. So I think, Bill, it's, it's all storylines. It's all, you know, it, you got to just take it all back. I'm him like a white bathrobe, putzing around his little tomato garden now oh. that he's retired, like, like at the end of uh, The Godfather. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he... Is that kid around? You guys, he is such a fascinating character. So fascinating. And, and and an incredible commissioner. And he, while he was commissioner, conducted, as you're suggesting, one of the great successful businesses in our time. And it's amazing. But the, thing, the only thing that I always think about all of this stuff is how could you possibly keep all of these people quiet? Because as much as even if they are a government person, all right, now whatever, not a government person, as much as they are like towing, towing the company line. Somebody's going to do blow, start running their yap. Someone's going to be a little too hammered. Someone's got, you know, trying to get this chick that they can't get and they got to fucking talk big about themselves. There's got to be some, how do you keep all of those people? Is it, Money just shuts everybody up? I, I think, and they were all complicit, right? All the referees who could really corroborate what Donahue's saying were all, all, they're all guys, you know, Dick Pavetta's retired in Ocala, Florida, I believe. Um, you know, Joey Crawford is bebopping around, still making money off the G League. Steve Javi is a deacon in the Catholic Church and a ESPN analyst now. And these guys, I, I just can't see any of them ever say anything. Um, you know, I've talked to a couple other referees who said some really interesting things off the record. Um, but really, these guys, you know, it is, it's a tight-knit fraternity. There's only 55 of them. Um, and Donahue, you know, they, they all look at Donahue as the black sheep, and, and rightfully so. But at the same well, time – That's amazing if that, that guy gets busted and they're still all able to keep their mouths shut because you would think that the FBI – could do the old, you know, really, I got a ref in the other room is saying something different. And then somebody like falls for that. The fact that they all were able to keep their mouths shut 
it's it, you know if everything that you're suggesting is true is pretty amazing it's um, yeah and what the nba did podcast though, man. thank you man i appreciate it and the nba issued a gag order right after they leaked the story and thwarted the f so the, the process was all right we're going to thwart the fbi's investigation by leaking the story it's going to become public everybody's going to know about it that's fine because we just can't have our guys talking about it they issued a a company-wide gag order the entire nba owners players fucking cowboys everybody shut the fuck up don't say a word you know your livelihood depends on it and everybody How melancholy said, a christmas the fbi agents have you, you know what's funny is these guys were all investigating you know drug cartels and murderers and this was a this was something they were interested in and something that they believed they they had a case against the nba they, they were very confident that they were going to be able to uncover a lot when it came to the nba as a corrupt business but these guys were putting away murderers they were you know this was the gambino family faction of the fbi these these guys were you know focused on taking down the gambino family and how can a murder. corporation just issue a gag order then i listen i'd love to talk to you mr fbi agent but the uh stern says i can't talk to you he's not above those guys no but he but think about this think about the nba system as a whole if you're a player and you critique a referee if you complain about a referee you get fined fifty thousand hundred thousand dollars right the nba system is a messed up system where the the referees are never held accountable for anything because they are a really important part of the nba business and you know being able to help determine which teams move on to the finals so i mean again we lay it all on the podcast and and Dude, I, I'm picturing this. This is like being in the writers' room at the beginning of a season for F is for Family. Like, okay, where where's the Murphy family gonna go? They're like, okay, what what's the NBA? Are we gonna let this storyline die? Are we gonna bring that back around? That's wild, man. That's a fascinating that's image. Wild. We've yeah. had a lot of guests on here. This is like, yeah, the Bitcoin and this one here. Like, I'm 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 definitely gonna be diving into these uh, whistleblower podcasts. Um, Tim Livingston, everybody. God yeah, man, damn, giving us crazy, just crazy enough. Music, brother. That was just awesome. That was, I, I'm it. telling you, that was one of the better podcasts we've ever done. Thank you, Bert. Appreciate I mean, this was yeah. so much fun, you guys. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys having me on. Big fan. And this was, this was so much fun. All right. Don't talk about any important shit with a flat screen in a room, okay? I won't. I won't. This is pretty discreet, right? My setup, you guys got much better <laughs> room setups, but I'm just in a now i'm laying don't low. say where you're at they're gonna find you jeez i thought we were stop recording out of la andrew oh i thought we were done andrew you gotta bleep that out that's gotta be bleeped out oh Thanks. bleep that out bleep that out fuck yeah fuck yeah <laughs> all right let me do the outro here before you get whacked live on this podcast <laughs> jesus bert all right ladies and gentlemen this has been another wonderful episode of the bill bert pod yes. all right thank you tim
Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, it's Bill Burr, and it's time for another wonderful episode of the Bill Burr Podcast. What's going on? How are you, Burt? I'm doing good. I'm having a, a clean today, Bill. Every time I clean, I think of you, because I know you like cleaning. I don't like cleaning. I just don't like a dirty house. Yeah, I'd rather live in misery and squalor and be happy. I can be happy in a, as, a, as a hoarder. As a hoarder? Yeah, I could. I could be okay. happy. All right. Well, that's good. Do you, do you follow the NBA, Bill? I used to follow the NBA. I uh, somewhere along the line, once it was like all all the stars became friends, then they all pile on one team and then beat the shit out of the other thirty. I just there was something just weird about it. Like uh, I sort of maintain. If you watch Jordan's The Last Dance, one of the best parts was when he couldn't get past the Pistons. So he dug down deeper, he got tougher mentally, lifted weights. All these guys today, so many of them, at that point in their documentary, it's like you couldn't get past the Milwaukee Bucks, so what did you do? Oh, I just signed with them the next year. It'd be like Bird becoming a Laker or Magic becoming a Celtic. The whole thing is weird. Um, But speaking... Yeah, introduce our guest. Of the NBA, we have a guy who wrote a, uh, a book about some interesting things that have gone on in the NBA. Tim Livingston, everybody, who is uh, – welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. We, so there was confusion. Andrew and I were talking about that offline. I, we did a podcast on the NBA, not wrote a book. So. Oh, I thought it was a book. Yeah, he's got a podcast. Uh, he's got a podcast called Whistleblower. Who Fixed the NBA? This is the biggest scandal in sports history that I got to be honest with you, I got whispers of, but it wasn't, it wasn't laid on to me like the way that was the Black Sox scandal, you know, like, and I know that it's as big, if not bigger than that, it got swept under the rug, I feel like a little bit. And I, and I got to be honest, with you, I want to start here, Tim, because I don't want to get right into it. But I'm curious, I stopped watching the NBA. I, when, I, when I got older than the players, for some reason, I no longer could enjoy it. When I was a kid and I looked up to them, I was there. I was like Magic Bird, Jordan, Isaiah, Dominique Wilkins. I was really into basketball. And then all of a sudden when I got old, like Sean Kemp's the last player, I was like, "Ah, I love that dude. And then all of a sudden I became their age and I was like, eh. How how do you feel about that, Tim? Well, it's this year's draft. All the kids were born in 2000 or 2001 which is truly bizarre. Um, yeah, right? But yeah, I grew up a huge basketball fan. I grew up in Los Angeles. I was a Lakers fan and kind of became disillusioned with the NBA in, in similar ways that you guys did as I got a little bit older. Um, but the big thing for me, and this is what the story is about, is the, dis- the disillusionment really came from basketball being way too close to professional wrestling. And that's what we dive into in this podcast is – how, how close was it? The fine line between entertainment and a true athletic competition, you know, did they deviate along that line? And that's, that's kind of what this story is about. Well, well I got to tell you, I felt like in the 2000s, people used to think I was a conspiracy theorist. I was watching games and I'm going, these games are fixed. And people said, you're out of your mind. I remember, clearly remember, I went to a Utah Jazz game the Celtics were in town. I was doing a gig or something. I went to the game. And, you know, if the ref's calling it close, they're calling it close. Or if they're letting them play, they let them play. But this was like civil. They were doing both for, like, chunks of the game. Seven minutes, they're letting them play. Another seven minutes, they're calling everything. And I was just like, this, this is like they're, they're, they're switching off officiating things. 
And um, I also felt overall that that Celtics Lakers thing that happened organically that then led us into the Bulls made that that league pass everybody and then they have tried to finesse I wouldn't say autumn like fix but they did everything they could because those were basically two super teams through the drafts and a couple of shrewd trades like Robert Parrish was a shrewd trade um and it, it, like and I feel like ever since then they have been looking for the uh, the, the the Celtics Laker thing again it, to the point I think they looked the other way with the Kevin Garnett trade where we got him for nothing and Kevin McHale was in the front office and then all of a sudden the Celtics went from nothing to being in the two years in a row with the Lakers in the finals or the final whatever you call it we win in in 08 or something like that and then in 09. Like, that was like a grudge match with the refs and Rasheed Wallace. And they were calling, like, reputation fouls in, in a game seven. They were letting their Beyonce diva bullshit with this guy get in the way of the two franchises, which are the NBA. And I watched the Lakers beat the Celtics, taking unguarded free throw shots, like something like 35 to, like, 15 and... I, I don't I don't know I just I just felt like it it sort of it just became like let's and then LeBron going to the Heat and how much they hated that and but everybody watched because they wanted to lose then it became like the villain in wrestling so then it's like hey let's let Durant go to the uh, to the uh, to the Warriors which that season was just like a bad summertime movie you knew what was going to happen from the very beginning so that's that's kind of what happened with me but. No, um, and you're right. I mean, <laughs> no, you're right. Because Bill, the big, the big word, and it's not a can. What I say is, after our investigation, if you listen to all ten episodes of Whistleblower, conspiracy theory. You can drop the word theory. There was a conspiracy here, and it went up to during the Donahue scandal. It went up to the highest levels of government that made this thing go away. Because in 2007, 2008, there was an FBI investigation where they were going to wire up Tim Donahue. And he was going to call every referee in the NBA and say, hey, when Dick Bavetta referees a game six or a game seven, does he have a motive? Does he want a certain team to win? And does the NBA want a certain team to win? And if you look at the 2002 Western Conference Finals between the Lakers and the Sacramento Kings, game six, that was the most egregious officiating in the history of the NBA. I mean, Ralph Nader wrote a letter to David Stern afterwards, Michael Wilbon and every basketball pundit out there said said as much but there was no proof right until donahue came out and and laid it all out um however the nba was able to say well tim donahue's a criminal which he was he committed the cardinal sin you know he was fixing games himself um but that's why this is such a fascinating scandal it's if you have two eyes and you understand basketball you understand that something was happening here and what the nba has tried to do bill you're right is create storylines Who's going to sell more tickets in 2002, Chris Webber and Vladi Divac or Kobe Bryant and Shaq? And that's, that's really what this comes down to is over the last 20, 30 years, over the David Stern era, how many of these games were rigged? And according to our investigation, if you really look at the stats and you talk to the players who played in the game, we interviewed Rasheed Wallace, we interviewed Bonzi Wells and Nate Robinson and George Carl and a bunch of other NBA figures. And look, the NBA is always going to have – plausible deniability Re refereeing in general is the most subjective art form in in the world like anything can be a foul or nothing can be a foul um you can let them play or, or call call everything but at the end of the day you know are, were these games rigged was there a conspiracy or or is it all conjecture is it all theory and in my opinion there was a conspiracy here and i remember seeing kevin garnett i think he might have been playing with uh uh, Brooklyn Nets or something like that, or whatever it was. No, he was he was he he was with Brooklyn at the time, talking about when he was playing with the Celtics, and they played somebody I forget who, but he goes, "We were not part of the NBA script that year." It was the closest I ever heard. I mean, it was like boxing. It's I I actually you know I think it's like painfully obvious that how they were almost bankrupt and the Lakers Celtics rivalry rivalry saved them that that then became their business model 
once Jordan all of a sudden retires in 2008, what are we going to do? And they had the Spurs, but they lacked the star power sort of thing. People said that they were boring or whatever. And like, I mean, I think that there's just sort of an unwritten rule that the Lakers have to be good. That they, they, that like, they just got to set, they just funnel this is pipeline of free agents that just goes there. It doesn't make any sense to me that like Anthony Davis doesn't stay with New Orleans and then they get Zion and then their fans get to enjoy a run. Like this whole thing where it's just like um, that they're one of their main cornerstones is the Lakers. Yet they also abandoned New York Knicks. I don't know. It's a weird run league, but I, I do think just as far as, it's a shit league for a fan unless you live in like certain markets. Um, they're ba- I mean, they've, I, is it me? They're basically telling Pelican fans to go fuck themselves, that you're essentially a professional farm team. Yeah. And that's. Well, can, I, can, I, can I jump in for one second? I'm super lost. <laughs> I, I, can we start it at page one and kind of tell me, because I heard Bill say that about the Lakers and the Celtics, and that does make sense. So, so what you're saying is, say you say it, Tim. I'd love to hear you. I, no, tell I'm, what happy. I'm happy. Let's let's go back to the beginning. So, okay. I mean, Bill's right. The NBA was almost the point of insolvency in the '80s uh, when David Stern took over. He was blessed in 1984 with Michael Jordan being drafted and the Celtics and Lakers creating this fantastic rivalry. Um, and from there. You know, we saw the Pistons in the in the late 80s and um, obviously Jordan's Bulls after that. There was just great NBA storylines. There was great drama. Um, but if you look at specific games, I'm not saying every NBA game was rigged throughout the course of history in the NBA. That's, that's ridiculous. That's not true. However, the NBA, I think David Stern, particularly as a businessman, realized, Bill, to your point, I mean, Stern was asked by Dan Patrick, what is your ideal NBA Finals matchup? Do you guys know what he said? What? No. Lakers versus Lakers. <laughs> so there's, there's been this and, – and just saying that, if you're an NBA referee and you hear that and the Lakers are playing the Jazz in the Western Conference Finals and it's game seven and there's a 50-50 block charge call, you know, tie game fourth quarter with Kobe Bryant driving the basket, does that not – is that not going to influence the guys? Of course it is, right? So – Going back, there's, you know, David Stern, just think of him as a puppeteer and think of the referees as, you know, I guess we're going from puppeteering to chess, but they were uh, essentially, you know, his pawns in, in making sure that certain teams advanced to the NBA finals. In 1993, this was a game that wasn't even on my radar. Lifelong NBA fan, I went on this crazy journey with Tim Donahue and, and became friends with Tim Donahue, and that's how I got all this information, which we can get into but in 1993, I'm interviewing George Carl, and the Game 7 of the, two, of the 1993 Western Conference Finals, it was Suns with Charles Barkley versus Bert, your, your boy, Sean Camp and the Sonics. Do you know how many I, – I forget if it's, it's 64. The Suns shot 64 free throws in Game 7, and it was the most – you know, people on Twitter after we came out of this podcast have, you know, hit me up and said, you know, you're, you were probably too young for that game. That was the most – ridiculously fucking officiated game in the history of, of basketball. And it was atrocious. And George Carl in game seven of the Western Conference Finals said he almost got thrown out in the first quarter and just kind of had to sit down and, and, and watch knowing that this game was going to be rigged. And so in the early 2000s, it got really bad because the Lakers were, were the team. And in 2000 against the Trailblazers, um, Shaq and Kobe had been together at that point for several years. They obviously had chemistry issues, and the Lakers had that amazing comeback from 15 points down in the fourth quarter. And look, Portland missed a bunch of shots in that game, but man, there were some really bad calls. And the Lakers ended up winning that title, and they won in 2001. And then in 2002, they were um, the second best team in the league, the Sacramento Kings, and, and won that title behind, again, the worst and most corrupt officiating in, in any sport that I've ever seen. And, and I think most sports fans would agree with that. So it's this whole journey of, you know, what is basketball? Is it wrestling? Why should we care as fans? It, to Bill's point, it's a really tough it's a business. It's a, it's a business. business and they need, 
They're stars. I think Kobe was Jordan's replacement, and he needed rings. He needed yep. to be chasing this. You saw what happened to golf when Tiger Woods, you know, when his body broke down, and then when he comes back, you know, it, it, the ratings go through the roof. So it is like a star-driven thing, and 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 basketball is the easiest game to fix because it's the only one you can't in football. You can't put. You know, you can't put uh, uh, Russell Wilson on the sidelines. NBA, you can literally take guys out of the game. You just give them two quick fouls, you know, and oh, then they wow. got them on the bench. You give them another one. Now they got three, and then you won't see them until the second half. You give them that quick one. It's just – or at the very least, you, they're, they're going to be playing more timid. Um, it's – it's. Uh, so then it's how, 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 did, how, did, how did this – how did David Stern – uh, affect the 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 officials did it was it i'm curious that's a great question so according to tim donahy and really according this is what we did we went back and we read after the donahy scandal the nba um commissioner report it's the same as the wells report or any other league sanctioned report it's all bullshit right they they hire a law firm it's a law firm conducting an independent investigation when they're getting paid by the league itself but that was called the Pedowitz Report. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. And a big referee at the center of all this was a guy named Dick Bavetta. And Dick Bavetta was a guy that Tim Donahue said. Again, <laughs> Bavetta was the top referee. Bill knows who he is. Wait, wait, why I'm is just it? like, hey, Dick Bavetta. Let me handle this. Like, <laughs> I'm mean, just hey, saying, Tom. Italians always get pissed at those stereotypes. And here we are again. <laughs> you know what, though? I mean, we interviewed Michael Franzese, who is a former uh, – Capo and the Colombo family, um, known as the Yuppie Don, really brilliant mobster. And he said he had a bookmaking operation where he said he had two NBA referees on his payroll in the, in the 80s and 90s, and neither one of them was Tim Donahue. So there's only 57 guys in the league. You know, he's based out of New York. I, I don't, you know, he's, he's Italian, just saying. Um, Dick Pavetta, though, is a really interesting character in all this because he was – if you look at all the controversial games and Bill Simmons has written about this and countless other NBA writers and, and journalists have, have talked about it, but to Bill's point, it's like you can't really talk about it if you're an NBA beat writer, because then you're never going to be allowed in a locker room. You're going to be blackballed from, from the league. So this thing, it's always been this unknown or this known thing that people just don't talk about. Players talk about it. Behind closed doors, you know, Rasheed Wallace would look at a box score and be like, it, it, depending on the three reps, he'd be like, oh, we're going we're gonna to lose today. <laughs> like, a, I'm going to get two fouls in the first quarter. I'm going to sit on the bench. Wow. And they want the Lakers to win this game, clearly, because it's Dick Pavetta, Joey Crawford, and Steve Jaffe are refing this game. So, Having said that, he also did – he didn't do himself any service the way he treated the refs. Because I no. think that happens in baseball, too. If you show up a home plate umpire – I mean, if you don't make good on that, like the rest of your at-bats, you're going to have a tough night every time that guy is calling your game. They're humans, right? And because they're humans, you know, is it impossible to manipulate a referee? And the answer is no. And so, Bert, just to go back to your question with Dick Pavetta, what Donahue said is that there was company men referees in the NBA who were very open about being assigned to certain games to procure certain outcomes. Uh, produce certain outcomes so that's what Donna he said and when he said it I heard it as a young journalist and I was like that makes sense and that's where this all started I wrote an article where I said hey uh, it's been it was five years after the scandal but I all I said was hey I kind of believe what Tim Donahue's saying about the NBA it, it adds up and that's where Tim Donahue reached out to me because I was the first person to ever say anything publicly about this guy that wasn't he's a, a crook and a scoundrel um, and he and I formed this very bizarre friendship and he's told me stories, which I haven't been able to, to tell. I can't say a lot of it on the record, but there's a referee, um, during the Bulls era who, whose mistress was in Chicago. And so he used to referee games, win or lose. This wasn't Donnie. It was another referee, win or lose to get back to Chicago. So he could, you know, have intercourse with his mistress. Like that was, so NBA games were getting manipulated so a guy could get laid. It was the Wild Wild West. It was, a, it was a complete shit show. And the NBA knew it, and they didn't care. Guys had drinking problems, drug problems, um, and, and David Stern didn't care because 
it got to a point where he needed these referees to produce certain outcomes because Michael Jordan was retired and the Lakers and Celtics weren't the Lakers and Celtics. And so if you look at the NBA in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s, it, there were some games that were really bad, really, here's really a, bad. Here's a question I have because the referees make way, 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 way less money than these players. How much do they so make? Now, so now you're trying to get them to, what'd you say, Bart? How much does a referee make? It depends. So junior referees, it's, it's tiered. Um, anywhere between now, probably $150,000 to the, the top guys make close to a million dollars. And they make a huge amount of money based on their playoff and finals bonus checks. So basically, the more games you, you can double your payday as a senior referee by working a ton of playoff and finals games. And so this goes back to the problem. How do you work? It making sense. This how, starts how making work? a lot of sense. So that's how they pay Because I was going to say, you know, if they're making shit money and then they're sitting on this big thing that the NBA's fixed, what's stopping them from being like, I'll just go to TMZ, get one big fat check and leave. So what they do is they give them a long career. You're a company guy. God, how, no. do you, how do you stop them from going Jose Consenco after they retire and go, he was doing it, and he was doing no, it. it's How brilliant. Do it? This is, so this is what the NBA does. The, the NBA keeps them on the payroll forever. So the NBA, if you look at all the guys oh, I'm talking shit. about. Shut they're, up. They're, fuck they're, up. They're, they're analysts on ES, – Steve Jabby is an analyst on ESPN. Monty McCutcheon, Joey Crawford. All these guys are, are now the G League supervisor of officials. That, look, with, if, if referee is the only thing on your resume, what are you going to do when you retire, right? Nothing. Like you're – that's your job. That's the only thing that you know. It's your only experience in the workforce. So you can't go unless you're Donahue and get, you know, get blackballed. That's all you can do. So you've reached the pinnacle with the NBA. You do that for a long time. And yeah, and if you want to go write your expose, David Stern was smart. And he said, no, we're going to keep, we're going to keep paying you what, what we're paying you until you die. And so that's why none of these guys have ever come forward. They're all still on the teat. They're all still getting paid. So this, this is like their, their pay girlfriends, like the NBA guys who are screwing around. They got their wife, and then they got their pay girlfriends. They just buy them shit, so they'll keep banging them. So the NBA also has pay girlfriends with the, the officiating, is what you're saying. Allegedly. So we don't allegedly, get allegedly. 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 Um, wow, that's crazy. Because it, now this makes – this makes like almost genius sense. You go, you go, hey man, I call the games that the commissioner likes and they're good games and the, and the big teams win and we help build stars and he's going to want me to be in the big games with those stars officiating the great game. I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like, uh, it, it's, it's problematic. It's like having a bartender that does shots. They sell a bunch of drinks, but they're also getting fucking wasted. Yeah, and these guys used to just – alcohol is, you know, as part of this thing. These guys were drinking and gambling casinos, and this was all known. This was part of the refereeing culture. These are blue-collar guys who all – and we get into this in the podcast. There was like 14 referees from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, all blue-collar Whoa. blue-collar bros, and Donahue was one of them. And it, it, this wasn't America. How did he get caught? All of these guys are doing this shit – did, it was it because he went outside the NBA pay girlfriend thing and he tried to cheat on him with the mob? Like what yeah, happened? So, so what Donahue did was – so, again, we, we've talked to other people. Michael Franzese was the only one who was on the record. Again, former mobster who said he had two NBA referees just on his payroll fixing games forever, right? So well, Hang on. Start here, start here, start here. I, I, this is a, Bill has a great question. I want to hear that, but I want to know – tell me a little bit about Tim Donahue. Let's yep. start with Tim Donahue. I don't know. I know that he got busted. I'm assuming he's from Delaware County. <laughs> but, but tell me about Tim Donahue. So Tim Donahue started refereeing in 1994. And his, Tim Donahue's father was a college referee. His uncle was an NBA referee. Obviously, all hail from that same area around Philadelphia called Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Um, so Tim Donahue, at 27 years old, I believe, got his got – his foot in the door as a referee in the NBA and was a really good referee. Uh, according to most people, he was a hothead. Uh, most players and coaches say that from the get go, this guy had had an anger problem and had a temper, but for his first nine years in the NBA, we have no evidence that said that he was manipulating, manipulating games in any way. 
he, by all accounts, was just an up-and-coming referee. Um, and again, re- referees get fired. If you're not good after nine years, you're going you're gonna to get canned. He was starting more playoff games. You know, he was, he was working his way up. Um, and then in 2003, he, again, this is, as we get into the podcast, you can only believe what Tim Donahue says. You got to take everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. Um, that being said, there's a lot that's public. There's a lot in the FBI, FBI files. There's a lot that it, when you do your research, you can corroborate and, and is true. So he started, he started gambling on games that he refereed and allegedly fixing them um, in 2003. So for, from 2003 to 2007, that's a long time. Tim Donahue was betting on games that he refereed. So that's 260 games during that period that this one referee had money on. So that's 260 NBA games that, uh, you know, whether, whether you want to say the word fixed or not, they were being manipulated against the point spread. Um, so that's, that's Tim Donahue in a nutshell. Tim Donahue got caught on a Gambino wiretap. And so what happened is towards around 2006, 2007, Donahue thought he was never going to get caught because this was so easy. This was not difficult. It's not difficult for an NBA referee if the Pistons are favored by five points over the Hawks to make sure that the Pistons win by seven instead of four. That's not hard. That's a really easy thing to manipulate. And he was winning, according to him, 80, but according to another, his co-conspirator, 90. So let's say like 90% of his bets, right? So that's not, you're not betting. You're just printing money. So he was doing this so for years. What kind year. of bookie keeps taking? Who? What kind of bookie is going to take a, a a bet from a guy who's refereeing the game unless they're in on it? So that's so, so he that one was. They were saying, "Hey, make sure the Pistons win by more than five tonight, and we'll let you put." He's not even betting; they're just paying him to do it. A hundred percent. So he was getting paid again. He was. I think the big question with Donahue is how many people was he giving tips to and, and getting money from. So it wasn't Donahue. Again, this is pre-internet gambling being what it is today. So there was guys in New York and Philadelphia who caught wind of the scheme and were kicking Donahue back money. Um, but Donahue was involved with a, with a really big bookmaker named Jimmy Batista. Um, and Batista moved. He was really a money mover. He wasn't a better, but he moved money for some of the biggest sports betters in the world. And he caught one of the scheme and approached Donahue. Um, and so basically what happened, long story short, Jimmy Batista had a pill problem and, and a cocaine problem, got caught up with the wrong guys, um, got, into, got into some serious seven-figure debt and started yapping that, that hey, don't worry, I'm going to pay you back. I, I got a referee in my hip pocket. FBI heard that. Mm-hmm. FBI put two and two together, realized that ref was Tim Donahue, and, and the rest is history. But – Donahue didn't realize that the games that he was betting on when, when the scheme got big in 2006, the games that Donahue was betting on professional bookmakers were betting millions, millions of dollars per game in international markets in Europe and in the U S. So when Donahue refere- refereed a game where we, we speculate that it was close to a billion dollars during the course of his scheme that moved just on this one guy's games. So he had no idea how, how big this got. And when he got caught and when the FBI got involved, he didn't know. He thought it was still reasonably small. He thought he would be making an extra, you know, God knows how much money every year for his entire career in the NBA. And this was a guy who was going to be refereeing. If he was still refereeing today, his peer, this guy named Scott Foster, and Bill, I don't know if that rings a bell. Scott Foster is the top NBA official today. Scott Foster and Tim Donahue were best friends. They exchanged 134 phone calls at the peak of this scheme and on the, on the phone that the FBI says Donahue was using for gambling. Um, and Scott Foster is the top NBA official today. Never had to answer any questions about this. Um, the FBI came out, you know, this all came out and this is the guy that we're trusting today to referee the most important games in the league. I remember when that came out and they just put it on him. I'm like, what about the rest of the guys that were doing the game with him? It's like, how long could I shave points burnt on a game before you kind of like, Bill's acting, is he having an aneurysm? Like, what is he doing over there? Like, you'd know what was going on. They always go, they always get it to the lone crazed gunman whenever there's like this level stuff that is involved. I, I, 
am so glad that uh, you're, you're, I mean, my par I was just called paranoid, a conspiracy theorist. Like I, I just got totally disenfranchised with the whole thing. It just looked just so manipulated, even like the whole creation of the super teams. And like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know how you watch a game seven and you call 30 something fouls on one team and the other team only in the teens, unless the other team is just hacking the shit out of you. But if it's just pedestrian shit, um, so I would think that then ESPN, everybody, because they're all making money off of it and making so much money off of it that everybody just sort of shuts up, except maybe at the Christmas party when somebody has a few and they just, they, everybody just buys the myth and sells the myth that this one guy, this one guy, like, so